Welcome everyone. Uh, this is Sandy Green, the Program Management Specialist here at WICSAP, and I am here with Jennifer Levy Peck, PhD, and we're going to have a conversation on what advocates need to know about therapy. Uh, thank you for joining us, and thank you and welcome, Jennifer. Thank you. This webinar serves as an introduction to the WICSAP booklet, What Advocates Need to Know About Therapy, which is available on the WICSAP website. It's important for advocates to know about therapy so they can help their clients with appropriate referrals and support. The therapy field can seem confusing because there's a variety of different professionals who provide therapy as well as a variety of different types of therapy. Advocacy clients and their families may have questions about therapy that you'll want to be able to answer. And you also want to make sure that you're able to make a smooth and comfortable referral if that's warranted. It's going to be important to know that the therapists you recommend have the needed expertise to work well with your client, whether it's a young child whose parent is requesting therapy, or a teen, or an adult who's seeking therapy on their own. These are our learning objectives for this webinar. By the end of the training, you'll be able to describe the differences among the various mental health professions and know the names of the different professionals and what they can do and what they can't do. And I hope that this is going to be clearer once we go through this. You've also probably read or heard the term evidence-based treatment, and we'll look at what that really means. We'll also be exploring how to talk about therapy with survivors and their families so that you can make strong referrals and support your clients while respecting the differences between advocacy and therapy. And we'll talk about how to find and cultivate therapists in your community who are really knowledgeable about sexual abuse and assault issues so that your clients can get the best treatment available. So now we're going to be looking at some of the various mental health professionals. Um, I've been a psychologist for about three decades, and I have to laugh because so many times people have said, oh, so you're a psychiatrist. And no, I'm not a psychiatrist. Um, so I want to explain the differences among the various types of mental health professionals who provide treatment so that you can understand their credentials. First of all, psychiatrists are medical doctors. They go to medical school just like a family doctor or a neurologist, for example, and then they go on to receive specialized training in psychiatry, which is a field of medicine. Some, ther some psychiatrists do offer psychotherapeutic treatment or therapy, but for the most part, psychiatrists in the community perform evaluations and prescribe medications to treat conditions like depression, anxiety, or schizophrenia. Usually, if a sexual abuse or assault survivor is seeing a psychiatrist for the after effects of trauma, they're going to also be receiving treatment from another mental health professional. A psychiatrist normally has an MD degree from medical school or a DO degree from a school of osteopathy. Board certified psychiatrists have passed the national examination administered by the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology. So again, psychiatrists perform, uh, provide medical and psychiatric evaluations, treat psychiatric disorders. Sometimes they provide psychotherapy, but not often, and they prescribe and monitor medications. There are several subspecialty boards in psychiatry, including child and adolescent psychiatry, forensic psychiatry, and addiction psychiatry. Most of the time, other mental health professionals have a professional relationship with one or more psychiatrists. So for example, if somebody's seeing a counselor, that counselor will have a psychiatrist in mind or several psychiatrists in mind that they can refer the, the client to if they need medication evaluation or management. A good source of information about mental health professionals is the NAMI website. NAMI is the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill. Also, I don't have this on the slide, but there are also professionals known as psychiatric or mental health nurse practitioners. These are registered nurses who go on to obtain graduate degrees and additional training. And they often do just about everything a psychiatrist might do. And they work in association with a psychiatrist. This is often a more affordable or accessible alternative to a psychiatrist for someone who needs medication evaluation or monitoring, especially in areas where psychiatrists are in short supply. And these psychiatric nurse practitioners can really be great to work with. Next, we come to a psychologist. 
the psychologist is an individual who has doctoral level graduate training in the mental health field. Psychologists may have a PhD, a PsyD, PSYD that is, or an EDD, which is an educational degree that some counseling psychologists obtain. They should be licensed by the state or working under supervision to obtain a license. Psychologists are usually the professionals who do psychological testing and evaluation, and they can also provide psychotherapy to treat a wide variety of behavioral and emotional issues. Some psychologists specialize in working with certain types of problems or age ranges, while others are generalists. It's unethical for people who do not have the full qualifications to be a psychologist to call themselves a psychologist. A psychologist does a full year internship under supervision before graduation and then has to have additional supervised practice and take an exam before becoming licensed. So the next professional we're gonna talk about is a licensed mental health counselor. The term counselor can sometimes be confusing because we may use it in a general sense. For example, we might talk about someone getting religious counseling or career counseling, and we don't necessarily know the credentials of the person providing that counseling. Some sexual assault programs even refer to their advocates as counselors, which I think is not a good idea because it creates role confusion. A licensed mental health counselor is a person in a specific profession in the state of Washington. These counselors must have at least a master's degree, usually from a mental health counseling graduate program, and then they have three years of supervised practice after they get their degree and have to take an exam before becoming licensed. So if someone says they're seeing a counselor, you might wanna find out whether this is an informal counseling arrangement or if they're actually receiving treatment from a licensed mental health counselor. There are also mental health professionals known as marriage and family therapists. These people have at least a master's degree and supervised practice specific to marriage and family therapy. They may graduate from a program that's called a marriage and family therapy program, or they may have some other type of mental health master's degree and have taken specialized courses to qualify for this credential. Social workers are sometimes misunderstood as mental health professionals. The term social worker is sometimes used to describe a person with a bachelor's degree or maybe without even a bachelor's degree who works for an agency or the government as a caseworker. However, there is a specialized type of social worker known as a clinical social worker who provides mental health evaluation and psychotherapy. These professionals have a master's degree in social work, which is usually known as an MSW, and supervised practice, and they have to pass an exam and become licensed. They are highly qualified therapists, even though people sometimes underrate them, saying things like, oh, I'm just seeing a social worker. And sometimes you'll hear LCSW, and that's a licensed clinical social worker. In Washington State, we also have a licensing category known as chemical dependency professionals. These people are not therapists, but they provide counseling to people with alcohol or drug addiction problems. They may be very helpful to folks with substance abuse issues, but they're not qualified to provide psychotherapy or to treat sexual abuse or assault trauma. So we, I wanna clarify some terms that are used um, because I think it's important to use the titles of mental health professionals accurately and to know what they do and don't mean. The term psychotherapist or therapist describes the kind of work the professional is doing, not their qualifications. So someone who's called a therapist could be a psychologist, a clinical social worker, or a mental health counselor, for example. As I mentioned before, the term counselor is often used loosely, so it's important to know whether or not the individual is a licensed mental health counselor. You may also have occasion to refer a family to a sex offender treatment provider. For example, if you're working with a child survivor and the abuser is an older child or teen in the family. In Washington, sex offender treatment providers are licensed mental health professionals who go on to obtain specialized training in this particular issue and then pass an exam. You might also encounter a client who says that they're seeing a pastoral counselor. Washington State does not have specific licensing requirements for pastoral counselors who are religious counselors, although some pastoral counselors have another type of mental health licensure along with their training in religious issues and spiritual guidance. There is a national certification for pastoral counselors who have advanced mental health degrees along with religious training, but not all pastoral counselors have these credentials. So 
So finding out about a therapist's credentials can be very important. However, even if the person is a licensed mental health professional in one of the categories we just discussed, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're particularly knowledgeable about sexual abuse and sexual assault issues. I really believe that most survivors will be best served by seeing a professional with this kind of special expertise. A professional who has extra training and supervised experience in working with survivors will know about the types of treatment that have been shown to be most effective, the resources a survivor may need, and the dynamics involved in sexual abuse and assault. In addition, this type of therapist should know about sexual assault advocacy and be supportive of your agency and of your role as an advocate. Here in Washington, we're fortunate to have a program specifically designed to help therapists become more knowledgeable about treating survivors of sexual violence because the kind of training people get on, uh, on this topic in their graduate programs really varies. There's a therapist core training here in Washington that's offered by WICSAP, the Washington Coalition of Sexual Assault Programs, and it not only offers therapists information on effective treatment for survivors, but it gives them an overview of advocacy and the principles that underlie the sexual assault field. We don't want therapists treating survivors without a good context for why sexual violence happens, how it intersects with various forms of oppression, what it does to the family and the community, and why it's not just a matter of what happened to a particular individual, as important as that is. Sometimes people have a hard time asking professionals about their background. It takes a certain type of assertiveness to do this, and it may also be hard for people to do this when they're in crisis or suffering from the after effects of trauma. So it can be really helpful if you can investigate the credentials of some mental health professionals in your own community, and if you can support and empower your clients to do their own investigation if they wish to do so. And by investigation, I'm talking about finding out, is the person really licensed? What's their background? What's their experience? and what kind of knowledge do they have about working with sexual abuse or assault survivors. So here's a really cool way to check credentials. Uh, It's an online tool provided by the Washington State Department of Health. It's called the Provider Credential Search. If you know a provider's name, you can check without having to know their profession. So for example, if you wanted to look me up, (laughs) you could go to this site and you would enter my first name and my last name and hit search and you'll see a screen that tells you that I'm a licensed psychologist. It gives you my year of birth, so no more secrets. Um, It tells you that my license is active, and it tells you whether or not there's been any enforcement action, which is disciplinary action, and you'll be glad to know I don't have any. So you can also search by a person's license number. I don't know why you would happen to have a person's license number, but if you did, you could search that way too. So this doesn't tell you Uh, if the person has specialized training in treating survivors or anything like that, but at least you can find out if they have the basic credential, which is the state license in their profession, and you can find out whether they've been in any kind of trouble with the licensing board, which is a good thing to know. So to shift gears a bit, let's talk about the term that I mentioned before, evidence-based treatment. It's not easy to go through therapy to deal with trauma, So it's reasonable for survivors and their families to want to know whether treatment's going to be effective. The good news is that there's quite a bit of research going on to determine what kinds of treatment are most effective and with whom. However, you have to know that the research world and the clinical world are not a perfect fit. Most of the types of treatment that have been studied are the ones that that are easier to standardize. In other words, these are the types of treatment that follow a specific manual usually, and they're based on some form of behavior therapy, which looks at observable behaviors. And it's not necessarily because those are the best forms of therapy, but they're kind of the easiest to study. Um, You can see it would be easier to study external behaviors than to study people's internalized experiences, although there are ways to get at that as well. But there may be some types of therapy that work really well in the real world for particular clients, but they're not considered to be evidence-based because there hasn't been enough research done to prove that they're evidence-based. A really great resource if you're working with children and adolescents is the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, which maintains a list of effective and promising types of treatment for children and adolescents and their families. And you can see that there's a a link here on the slide. If you're working primarily with adults, 
uh, the Veterans Administration, the VA, has excellent online resources. They even have um, a, a very cute little two or three minute whiteboard video that explains what evidence-based treatment is. And you might want to look for that online and that would be a fun thing to show at a staff meeting, for example, to share that information and talk about what is evidence-based treatment. And they have other little whiteboard videos like that that explain some of the basic information about treating tra traumatic conditions. So uh, do look at the VA resources because they're, they're worthwhile. This is a list of some of the most widely used therapies for sexual abuse and assault. Uh, the list of effective therapies is growing all the time as more research is being done. As an advocate, you don't have to become an expert on the different forms of therapy. There will not be a quiz, <laughs> but you may want to look up some information on these treatments just so you can have a good general idea of what they involve. This would also be a great topic for an invited presentation by a mental health professional in your community. For example, if you have a local therapist who uses TFCBT, you might ask them to come into your agency and give the advocates an overview of what's involved in this type of therapy, why they use it, what a client might expect, and how it works. So the trauma-focused cognitive behavior therapy is a kind of therapy that um, is used quite a bit, especially for children and adolescents, but some version of it with adults as well. And there's quite a bit of online information about that if you're interested in looking at it. PCIT is parent-child interaction therapy, and that is often used with parents of children, young children who may have behavior problems and who have suffered some sort of trauma or abuse. There's cognitive processing therapy, which really focuses on the thoughts and what the person is thinking about what's going on. Dialectical behavior therapy was originally designed for people with what are called personality disorders, which are kind of pervasive ways of looking at the world that become dysfunctional. A uh, very interesting form of therapy is EMDR, EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy, which works on the principle of retraining the brain so that the traumatic memories don't have so much power and hold over the individual. Sometimes family therapy is very helpful, especially with children or adolescents and their non-offending parents. And then there are group therapies of all different kinds. So uh, these are different forms of therapy that you may want to become familiar with. And there's a little more information about them in the booklet, What Advocates Need to Know About Therapy. When you're considering referring a client to a therapist in your community, there are important things to consider. Is the therapist knowledgeable about your client's ethnic or cultural background, the, the age group of the client that you're talking about, any sexual orientation issues, or anything else that might affect the recovery process? That's what we're talking about when we're talking about cultural competency. If your client has language access needs, can the therapist meet them? For example, do you know therapists who can conduct therapy in Spanish or in American Sign, Sign Language? It's possible to use an interpreter for therapy, but you can imagine it might be difficult or awkward. And it's certainly preferable to have a therapist who's fluent in the client's language. And not just the client's language that they're able to speak, but their preferred language. Because think about it, when a person is in therapy, they're really talking about nuances, they're talking about intensely personal, intensely emotional issues. And um, so even if you have a client who is quite fluent in English, if, say, for example, Spanish is their first language and that's their preferred language, they might really rather have a therapist who is a native Spanish speaker. Does the client have any special needs that it would be helpful for the therapist to consider? For example, if you're working with a client who has Asperger's syndrome, is this something that the therapist has extensive experience in dealing with? Um, how accessible is the therapist's office for disability concerns? You, you may want to really know if you have clients who have specific disability access issues, you might want to go to some therapist's offices and actually see, is this going to work for a client with this form of disability? In addition, of course, it's important to respect the client's preferences. Some clients might want a male-identified therapist. Some clients might want a female-identified therapist. 
um, a teenager might not want someone who's too much older. They might do well with a young therapist. Um, an older person might feel uncomfortable with a younger therapist. So ask about what kind of therapist the client would prefer. They may not care. They may not know or they may not care. But if they do care, if it's important to them, then, of course, you would want to respect that if it's at all possible. Finally, knowing the therapist's referral procedures can be helpful, especially for clients who are in crisis. Obviously, if you are lucky enough to have some therapists who work either right in your advocacy program or on a contracted basis with your advocacy program, you probably know exactly how to make those referrals. But for therapists out in the community, you might want to know, does a therapist participate in an insurance network that requires a referral from a primary care physician, for example? Um, is it a mental health agency or clinic where the client's going to see one clinician for an intake interview and then be assigned to a different therapist? A lot of clients would like to know that. That may be really hard for someone who has trust issues related to trauma. Does the therapist participate in the client's insurance plan if the client is, does have health insurance? Or does the therapist work on a sliding fee scale uh, if you're not in a situation where services are paid for by your program? Having all of this information up front can really help your client to navigate the system. There may be times when you're seeing a teen client who wants therapy but doesn't want their parents to know that they're getting help. In terms of the law, a person who's 13 or older can sign for their own treatment. Of course, that's the way it is in most cases with sexual assault advocacy, and that's kind of based on the law for mental health treatment. However, unless the therapy is provided as a free service, if the teen is going to use any form of insurance to pay, the parent's going to know about that and have access to that information unless you're talking about perhaps an older teen who has access to um, a college counseling center or something like that. This may be a topic you want to discuss with therapists in your community to find out what their policies and procedures may be. In addition, even in a situation where the parents know that a young client is receiving therapy, the child or the teen may really want and need privacy to deal with the sexual assault. And you, you can really readily picture why that may be so. For example, the offender may be another family member, um, the, a relative of, you know, the mom's parent or the mom's sibling, for example. Um, it may be humiliating and embarrassing for the young person to talk about the specifics of what happened, but they may want, they may have questions about that and they may want to talk about the specifics of what happened with their therapist, but they don't want their parent to be there and they don't want their parent to know that they've talked about that. So one of the things that you can do as an advocate is you may be able to help a parent understand that it's not a rejection of their help and involvement if the child wants privacy, that they're actually being incredibly supportive by providing a private place where their child can process what happened to them without worrying about how it might affect the parent. And a lot of times therapists will work that out with the parent and the teen or the child early on in the therapy and they'll, they'll say, well, I'm going to be giving your mom and dad a general progress report about how you're doing in therapy, but I'm not going to be talking about the specifics that you talk to me. So if you have an argument with your mom and you're mad at her and you come in and tell me that you're mad at her, I'm not going to call up your mom and say, hey, you know, Susie's mad at you. So um, it, it's really important to get those confidentiality and privacy issues worked out clearly so that the child or the teen knows what the boundaries are and the parent knows too and, and your support can be helpful in that. Have you ever had the experience of a client confusing advocacy with therapy or vice versa? Most people have some general idea of what's involved in therapy from the movies and TV if nothing else. But very few people really know what sexual assault advocacy is all about, as I'm sure you're well aware. Clients may call you their therapist or even their shrink, <laughs> or they may try to work on issues with you that are best handled in therapy. They may be confused about why you're suggesting therapy or think that you're rejecting them and don't want to work with them anymore if you suggest that they see a therapist. And I'm talking to you as an advocate. So it's really critical that you explain exactly what advocacy services are and are not. Um, you certainly did that in the beginning with your clients when obtaining informed consent, 
but you know that people in crisis may not remember or be able to process that information later on. So for example, if you want to suggest therapy, it might be very helpful to start by reiterating the services you can and can't provide. Also, you may want to make you want to make sure that you're holding on to appropriate boundaries and not straying into therapeutic territory yourself. Some agencies have people who are trained as therapists who also provide advocacy services. So someone might, for example, be a licensed mental health counselor um, who does therapy for that agency, but then also handles the crisis line. It's important to be clear about what hat you're wearing and to stick to the appropriate role. Do any of these quotes sound familiar? So let's, let's take a look at some of them because they're common concerns that clients or their families may discuss with you. So the first one, does this mean that you think I'm crazy or, do you, or does it mean that you think I'm a bad parent when you refer the person to, to therapy, when you su suggest that maybe therapy would be helpful? Unfortunately, there's still stigma associated with therapy and it's super important to frame any discussion of therapy in a positive way, to talk about it as a way to build skills and to overcome difficulties as opposed to um, handling mental illness. I can't afford therapy. Many people don't know that there are free or affordable options for therapy, and you can really do them a tremendous service by sharing those resources. That's a big load off of a lot of people's minds, and there's quite a bit of information in the WICSEP booklet, uh, the booklet What Advocates Need to Know About Therapy, about cost issues. Won't talking about the abuse just make it harder for my child to get over it? Sometimes parents think that it's best to not say anything. They think that having their child go into therapy is just going to stir up a lot of feelings and emotions and make them more uncomfortable. Here's where you can explain that when a child goes through an experience of sexual abuse, it can affect their emotions, their behavior, their relationships, and their health in the long run. While it may be difficult to confront what happened, not just for the, the child, but for the parent as well, it can really help the child to make a full recovery. Um, a very common thing that people will ask is how can I talk my teenager into going into therapy? <laughs> and the short answer is you really can't. Um, you can sometimes talk teenagers into trying a session or two to see how that works for them, but if they're really, really resistant, it's not going to be effective. Sometimes you as an advocate may have more success in helping a teen see how therapy might be helpful than the parent because as you know, teens are primed to reject suggestions from their parents. So having somebody else talk about it with them may set up uh, less resistance. Ultimately, the parent may need to be patient and just wait until the child is ready. Or the parent can always seek help for himself or herself in learning how to better support the teen if the teen is not interested in going to therapy at that time. Um, parents may ask, isn't my child too young for therapy? Therapists who specialize in working with young children have techniques that are helpful even when the child's not particularly verbal. They can also support the parent in helping the child recover. So if it's the right therapist, there's no age that's really too young for therapy. And then finally, you may have clients who say, well, why can't I just talk to you? I trust you. And you can say something like, I'm so glad you trust me and you can talk to me about advocacy concerns for as long as you want and need to. But seeing a therapist doesn't mean that you can't talk to me anymore. However, therapists have specialized skills to help people get through the particular issue you're facing, such as, let's say, depression or anxiety. Each of us has something that will be useful to you, and I don't have the training or background to give you the support you need with that particular concern. One thing you may find helpful in the What Advocates Need to Know About Therapy booklet, there's some actual scripts for suggested wording of what you can say to clients, and that those can be helpful jumping off points. Of course, you have to customize them to your own particular individual style and to your own clients, but it can give you some beginning wording to, to get started, and it can help you maybe do some role plays with your colleagues so that you feel comfortable answering those questions and you're not fumbling when somebody does ask you those questions. So how do you talk to clients about therapy? Well, as an advocate, you can really help to make therapy seem less frightening, upsetting, or weird to clients. First of all, 
you can share some of the information you've learned in this webinar or from your reading or from the WixApp booklet or from any cross-training you may be able to participate in. If you don't know the answer to a question, just let the client know that you'll find out and get back to them. That's perfectly okay if they ask you something about how therapy works and uh, because they're considering therapy and you're just not sure about that, just tell them. That, that, that's a really great question and I'm going to find out. I know some great therapists I can talk to about that and I'll get back to you about it. As we've discussed, you can set the client's mind at ease that beginning therapy doesn't mean ending the advocacy relationship with you. Perhaps most important, you can let people know that therapy is a positive way to learn skills, not a way to fix someone who's crazy. And that, you know, that gets to be a real problem with parents of teens, for example, when a parent's trying to push a teen into therapy and they don't want to do it and it makes the teen feel like, well, my mom or dad thinks there's something wrong with me and they want me to go into therapy. And you want to kind of help them gently back off from that point of view because that's not what therapy's all about. You can help teens to see that therapy might help them to reach their own goals in life. And you can empathetically help parents to realize that they have an overwhelming task and they could use some help with it. It's not that they're not doing a good job or that they're not good parents, but that you know nobody asked for sexual abuse or assault to come into the lives of their family and anybody could use some help with that. Making the referral itself can be challenging sometimes. Um, if you happen to have therapists who work in or with your program on a regular basis, then you're very lucky and then that makes it much easier. But if you don't, it's really worth taking the time to get to know some therapists in your community and finding out who has the skills and the interest to work with survivors. Be aware of your agency's policies about referrals. They're going to have some policy about how you can make referrals and to whom you can make referrals. You can help connect a client to a therapist, but be sure to let the client make the actual appointment for the first visit. You don't want to overfunction in this situation, and it's important that they actually get on the phone and make the appointment because um, that ensures their connection there. Think about when it might be best to make a referral. Um, it's really helpful if you set the stage early in the advocacy program with, with everybody so that it's not just something that you bring up when a problem arises. You can start out by saying either that uh, your agency has therapists who work with them regularly, and if the client wants to take advantage of that service, you'll help to make it happen. Or if you don't have that arrangement, you can say you know therapists in the community who work with sexual assault or abuse survivors, and uh, if at some point that's something they're interested in, you'd be happy to talk more about that with them. If you bring up therapy uh, at a certain point because something's come up, Perhaps you've noticed that your client is becoming more and more depressed, and so you begin to talk about therapy, and the client says, no, I don't want to do it. Just shelve it temporarily. Don't, don't press, and don't be afraid to bring it up again in the future. You know, of course, ultimately, it is the, the client's choice whether to pursue therapy or not. So the logistics of therapy can seem quite overwhelming to someone who's in crisis. Think about for a moment about all the things in your house or your apartment or elsewhere that you could use some help with. Um, maybe you have a leaky faucet or there's some yard work that needs doing or an automobile repair or maybe you even need a new roof. Wouldn't it be cool if there were somebody who could take the time and the trouble to find out what kind of help you need and what you'd like to have and who there is in the community who does that kind of work and does it well? and how much it would cost and what the process would be like. Wouldn't that be great if someone could tell you all of that? Maybe you wouldn't put off needed repairs as long as you have that information. If you had a friend, for example, who could tell you that the work could be done at a price you could afford by a trustworthy person in a convenient way, you'd probably be all over it. So similarly, the process of finding a therapist and getting started can seem daunting to a client or to the parent of a client, particularly someone who's in crisis. If you have information at your fingertips, your client is more likely to take advantage of help when it's needed. And as we've mentioned, cost is a big concern, so consider all the options that are listed here and learn about what therapists use which payment methods. Um, so it, either there may be therapists that, the, that your agency has within the agency or can pay for. Their health insurance may cover some therapy. You can help them with crime victims' compensation. 
there may be agencies that help with costs such as Catholic Charities um, or Lutheran Family Services. And then most areas do have public mental health programs. But again, you want to make sure that if they're going outside of your agency that the person that they're going to has specific knowledge of how to work with sexual abuse and assault survivors. Another thing that's really helpful is to have brochures and cards in your office from therapists that you know personally and can vouch for, and also maybe some general information about therapy and what it is in your office so that people can pick that up in the waiting room. You can also help to demystify the process of therapy. You know, some clinics, for example, have waiting lists, and if someone calls up expecting an appointment that afternoon and without being in crisis, and there's a three-week waiting list at the mental health clinic in your town, they're going to be kind of taken aback. Um, so if there is a waiting list, this is where your advocacy skills can really help your client. And maybe you can help them find somebody who's a little further away but could see them sooner, or maybe there's a way to bypass the, the uh, waiting list in a crisis situation, and you may know about that. Another issue is that uh, some clients may not realize that they can't bring all of their other kids to an appointment, whether it's an appointment for themselves or an appointment for another child. And you can brainstorm with them to help them work out alternatives. You don't want them to show up at a therapy session with five kids under the age of 10 and the therapist says that they can't see them because there's no one to watch the kids in the waiting room and it's not appropriate for the kids to be in the, in the consultation room. Um, some clients are really naive about the process of therapy and they think it's like going to the doctor's office and you just go once or twice. So you want to kind of get an idea of your client's level of knowledge about therapy and the process of therapy. Some clients are going to know much more about therapy than you'll ever know because they've been in therapy on and off for years and years. But some of them may, may really be naive about it and it's helpful if you can give them some basic education and information about it explaining confidentiality issues and talking some about those professional boundaries that we've talked about can really be helpful in allaying anxieties. Uh, and the other thing is clients may want to ask a question of their therapist but not know how. Um, so they're looking for a therapist and they want, to, they want to ask, do you know how to work with this particular kind of problem? Like, for example, maybe someone is self-harming. Uh, you have a young person uh, an older teen or somebody in their 20s who's looking for a therapist on their own and they're self-harming, but they don't know how to ask that question. So you can kind of rehearse those questions and help them formulate how are they going to ask about that. Um, and then empower them to ask questions during the first session as well so that they can be sure that this is really the therapist for them. You sometimes have to walk a fine line between being supportive and getting in the way when an advocacy client is also in therapy. Your client may find therapy more difficult and more demanding than advocacy and may want to talk to you about issues that are best handled in therapy. Or they may want to complain about their therapist to you. Generally, this is the time to gently but firmly reiterate the boundaries and to redirect concerns about therapy to the therapist. And again, you can kind of help them practice how they're going to ask those those questions or how they're going to say that. But if it's a concern about the therapy, you want them to talk to their therapist about it. Um, now, there may be some situations that are really extreme. For example, if someone has a therapist who's being sexually inappropriate, obviously you're going to want to support them into taking action and maintaining safety. But generally speaking, you want to support them in hanging in there and talking things through with the therapist and going back to therapy even when it seems very difficult to them because a lot of times that's when they're getting the most out of it. In order to do all the things we've talked about in this training, you have to build relationships with the therapists in your community. Some of the best ways to do this are to work collaboratively on a multidisciplinary task force or to work together on applying for a grant um, another way is to develop cross-training opportunities where they come and do some training with you and your staff and you do some training with them and their staff. Um, or you may go to some trainings for therapists on related topics. For example, uh, if there's a training in the community about suicide prevention, 
you might go to that, even though it's primarily intended for therapists, and that's a way that you would get to meet therapists. Or your agency may host a training that's for a variety of community professionals, including therapists, and you can invite them to come to your agency. You could also just invite the therapist in the community to come in to your agency during a staff meeting to do a little show and tell about their services, and you can do the same thing. You can go to them and talk about your services. When you're working on your agency's community resource list, get specific information from therapists. Don't have it just be somebody who calls up and says, is this your, still your phone number? Uh, you want to find out what type of therapy do you provide? What are your areas of specialty? What is your profession? Uh, and are you licensed? What age groups do you work with and what, what do you prefer to work with? What payment arrangements do you or your office have and what insurances do you accept? Those are all things that it's really helpful to know. If you're trying to find therapists in the area who may be knowledgeable about working with sexual abuse issues, if there's a children's advocacy center in your community, that's a good resource because they have to have those kinds of collaborations and can share that information with you. So those are some ideas about how you can not only get to know therapists in the community, but build and continue to have relationships with them over a period of time. And then finally, this is a list of resources with links. Um, there is the, the publication, of course, which we've talked about. If you're not familiar with the WICSAP Child Sexual Abuse Advocacy and Therapy Tips, you can have those sent to you, and they're also available on the WICSAP website, and they provide brief information on a variety of topics related to both advocacy and therapy. I've mentioned the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, and that's a great website to look through. The National Children's Advocacy Center also has related training opportunities, and they've got a resource library. Uh, there's a web page called Should My Child See a Therapist that is something that you might want to print out and have as a, a tool when you're talking to parents about this. And then finally, the VA, the Department of Veterans Affairs, has a National Center for Post Traumatic Stress Disorder, and they've got a lot of information on about trauma-informed therapy for adults on their website that's really useful, and not just for veterans, but for any adults who may deal with traumatic issues. So that's the overview. I hope that this has been helpful to you and that you will feel a little more comfortable in talking to your clients about therapy, making referrals to them, knowledgeable referrals, supporting them while they're in the therapeutic process, and answering the questions that clients and their families may have about therapy. Thank you.